It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here with a special series brought to you by the NEI podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts with one part released each month. The next theme is on how to effectively manage complex treatment resistant psychotic disorders. In this theme, we will discuss several books, Treatment Resistant Psychotic Disorders by Dr. Michael Cummings and Dr. Stephen Stahl, The Clozapine Handbook by Dr. Jonathan Meyer and Dr. Stephen Stahl, and The Clinical Use of Antipsychotic Plasma Levels by Dr. Jonathan Meyer and Dr. Stephen Stahl. Today, Dr. Andy Cutler interviews Dr. Jonathan Meyer on the clinical use of antipsychotic plasma levels. Let's listen in to part three of our theme. Don't guess, measure the clinical use of antipsychotic plasma levels. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Psychopharmastology podcast. Today, I'm very excited once again to have with me my good friend, Dr. Jonathan Meyer, who is joining Stephen Stahl and myself. And our show today is called Don't Guess, Measure the Clinical Use of Antipsychotic Plasma Levels. And this is based on a relatively newer book that uh, Jonathan and Dr. Stahl have published on the clinical use of antipsychotic plasma levels. So Jonathan, welcome. Thank you so much, Andy. Great to be here again. And Steve, how are you doing today? Really good and proud to be a part of the book that uh, Jonathan put together and here to describe it and uh, show you how the tricks of the trade. There's some tricks of the trade coming, so please stand by. That <laughs> sounds good. Well, I agree with you. I think this is going to be a podcast that's going to be extremely valuable for our audience with lots of practical tips. But first of all, Jonathan, you have also written, of course, the Clozapine Handbook with Dr. Stahl, and we did another podcast on that book, which is incredibly useful. What was the genesis or the inspiration for writing this book? I think part of it is on the road to clozapine, we sometimes would have clinicians who thought that their patient was treatment resistant, but we found out sometimes that maybe they were either kinetic failures or adherence failures, and they weren't in need of clozapine just yet. The clinician hadn't been measuring drug levels, and they assumed somewhat incorrectly that the patient was either ingesting the drug where they weren't or that they were metabolizing the drug the way the, quote, average person does. And we recognized that there was a huge need to document what was going on, especially as you're dealing with sicker patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, so that you can hopefully optimize efficacy, number one, and you can decide when maybe more is not going to solve the problem. Let's say they are not on clozapine and more is not going to solve the problem either if they tolerated it. And then lastly, when you have people on stable oral medicines, which are antipsychotics, especially outpatients, so you can track to see if they're taking it or not. You mean that your patients like don't of- always take it when they, you always prescribe it? That's unbelievable. <laughs> Well, not my patient, Steve. Of course, other people's patients. Well, it's not uh, my patients. Stories. It must be Andy's patients because all my patients also yeah. take their medicines. That's what I think. <laughs> right. So, Well, you know, I, I used to use the old Freudian method where people came in, I'd put my hand on their forehead, and I'd estimate their level of adherence. But that didn't always work <laughs> out so well. And so mm-hmm. now, you know, when I have people on lithium or valproate every six months, I, I get a level. I mean, that sounds kind of stupid. And guess what? For people on oral antipsychotics, we probably should be doing the same thing because because adherence is dynamic. It's not static. It changes over time. And you want to figure out if your patient really is taking that medicine the way they say they were a few months ago. Steve, I've heard you say it in a very funny way. So I'm going to ask you, Steve, why should we measure plasma levels of antipsychotics? Well, because there are more liars in the world than there are people who have (laughs) funny livers that don't metabolize things. Uh So I hate to put it in such a nasty way, but, you know, the people have good intentions, but, you know, drugs don't work if you don't take them. And uh, one of the no-brainer parts of plasma levels, which actually is the least profound of all the things we're going to tell you in this podcast, is you can tell whether the patients are taking their drug and whether the levels are below any reasonable therapeutic threshold. And if they are, then you know obviously you have to raise the dose or get them to start taking the drug. 
But that is actually a, a problem. All of us think that we are good and our patients love us and that we are convincing and that it's very difficult to swallow the fact that some people don't follow our instructions. But we have to realize that noncompliance is part and parcel of taking anything from hypertensive drugs, antibiotics, and our patients may be a little more so. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's we're gonna say, and we we lament the fact that oh, our patients are schizophrenia, they're so ill, they forget. Go to the diabetes clinic; they got the same problem. You know, any chronic illness, oral non-adherence is common. It's just part and parcel of any chronic disease, and that's why you have to figure out if people, especially on oral medicines, are taking them both early on when you're titrating, and then later on during the maintenance phase to see if they're keeping up with it. Yeah. Steve, I've heard you use an automotive analogy. You can't drive without your headlights on. <laughs> well, that uh, yeah, exactly. I think that when people prescribe particularly antipsychotics and they don't measure blood levels, they don't know where they are on the road. So we don't drive at night without our lights. So why should we prescribe antipsychotics? Jonathan's got a way of saying it. If you prescribe antipsychotics, you must measure plasma drug levels or something like that. And that's just turning your lights on at night. Because I tell you, you can tell where the edge of the road is. You can tell whether there's traffic coming at you, if whether you're in the right lane or not. It's not that, that difficult. And we have strategies for whether the levels are too low because the dose is too low to actually get a normal level or whether there's other things going on that require, in some cases, you would say heroic dosing, but it can be justified on the back of sequential measurement of plasma drug levels. Well, Jonathan, that's a really good point. So we've talked a lot about adherence, but is there a way I can use plasma drug levels to ferret out adherence versus someone who's, say, a fast metabolizer and they're just at a subtherapeutic dose? Yes, I'll tell you the profound strategy. You actually end up getting more than one plasma level. I know, it sounds crazy. <laughs> the example is you get a new patient in your clinic. She says she's taking her risperidone, fine. You get a level, and it's below what you'd expect based upon the population average of risperidone, at least, you know, some ballpark guesstimate. Of course, is she an ultra-rapid metabolizer, or is she just non-adherent? Well, you know, if I was Dr. Stahl, I'd say she's probably non-adherent, and probably I would agree, <laughs> to be honest. But you're not sure. Then you talk to her. She says, oh, I take all my medicines, blah, blah, blah. Fine. She says whatever she says. If you get a second level, you're now an expert on that patient because if the second level is low and it's consistently low and it was done as a 12-hour trough, you know, about the same time, everything looks kosher as far as that goes, but it remains low, now you know she's adherent, she's just an ultra-rapid metabolizer. But if you see big jumps in levels between determinations on a fixed dose, you know, 50% or more, that's not adherence and then you know there's a different solution for that problem. So one low level, you might not be sure, with two low levels, or two levels rather, on a patient, everyone's an expert now, you know exactly what's going on. Well, you know, most of us have been taught during residencies that plasma drug levels in psychiatry don't mean anything, maybe except for lithium or, you know, rare kinds of drugs. And what they're talking about, we would probably agree. What's that? Random blood levels taken for somebody, you know, after they're on it once, would not help you very much at all in an individual patient. Jonathan said the key thing, it's iterative changes in uh, therapeutics to try to change plasma drug levels within the same patient. That's what we're talking about, is sequential use of this, not a random one-off thing, but actually, and you can earn the right to get plasma levels, which means you take a standard dose and you don't get better, <laughs> or you have you know lots of side effects at a standard dose. That earns you the right to do sequential blood monitoring, and that is very effective. Yeah, and I think the idea of adherence being a dynamic process, Jonathan, is really important. There is such that shows, you know, we, we think if our patients take their pills most of the time, that's pretty darn good. But there's data now that if you miss only 25% of your doses, you, your risk of relapse starts to go up. So I think and everyone has their own pattern. To monitor. Yeah, every, everyone has their own pattern. I mean, I think that's part of it. People can be stable for years. And then, you know, uh, we know the sad situation, a schizophrenic patient living with his older mom, dad's already passed away, now mom's ill, and things yeah. go haywire, and the person's no longer taking his medication because mom's not available to supervise, or the patient is stressed out. And that's why, again, why do we check a level every six months on somebody in Divalproex? To see if they're taking it. 
And I think it really comes down to non-adherence is common, but it changes over time. You have to monitor it on a chronic basis for people on oral meds. Doesn't matter if you're oral or LAI, there's a reason to get levels when we're titrating drug so we have a sense of people are getting the exposure we think. And most importantly, if they're not getting better, we can decide is more going to solve the problem. It doesn't always, but we need to figure out where we are in that range to decide on the next step. You know, you just made me think of something, Jonathan. With t- over time, we know as people age, the lithium level can creep up. And so that's certainly another reason you want to monitor lithium levels in particular. Does that happen with antipsychotics over time? Would somebody who is consistently adherent, w- could their levels creep up? Maybe over decades, as you really age into lower body mass, potentially, there may be also lower hepatic clearance. Again, another reason why over the long haul, if you had somebody on stable treatment, may want to get levels. There may also be pharmacodynamic changes, and that can be part and parcel of why you might want to consider altering doses. So you have the level there to back you up to say, well, I'm still within a range that seems reasonable, but this person now has aged into their drug-induced Parkinsonism because this dose was tolerable 20 years ago, but this brain is now 20 years older. That's a great point. So our dosing might need to be dynamic as well. Over time, we need to reevaluate and don't just set it and forget it, so to speak. I'm curious, though, why do so many clinicians not measure plasma levels? Well, the usual line I hear is, I wasn't trained on how to use them, which I'll accept up to a point. I only accept that so far. So, uh, Dr. Stahl, I was never trained on how to use cariperazine. Is that a reason for me not to use it? It wasn't there. You couldn't have been trained with it. And actually, (laughs) Jonathan Meyer hadn't written his book yet. So, you know, that's all fine and dandy. You didn't use it then, but this is today, and there's knowledge. And again, our vision is to make... Anybody who's listening to this, top prescribers, top mental health professionals at the top of the game. And if you have treatment resistance or treatment intolerance in psychosis, you have got to measure plasma drug levels to do the best. Yeah. And really, I created this book, to be honest, again, kind of guided by my interactions with the clinicians at the state hospital because they come to us and they'd heard the message and we would preach to them and they heard and they were converted. And they say, okay, great. I'm going to measure this gentleman's haloperidol level because he's on a pretty hefty dose and he's not getting better. And he's not stiff either. I don't know what's going on. We said, great. And then the question was, well, if he's on 20 haloperidol at bedtime, what level do I expect? And guess what? That was the one element that was often missing from all of the guidelines that you look at. Even these groups which have been publishing plasma level guidelines for psychotropics for years, they never tell you the correlations. But that's important. If you want to have some gross sense of what to do with the level, we have to know what you, result you expect when you order a test. Mm-hmm. So, so in this book, you have minimum therapeutic levels? Up available? I, well, I have a, a bunch of different types of information. So the one I was just alluding mm-hmm. to was just the concentration dose relationship. So it's just a multiplier, which you would take for every molecule, which says if you're taking the medicine all at night, and we encourage people to give antipsychotics all at bedtime because it improves tolerability and they work in the brain generally 24 hours a day. What 12-hour trough do you expect for each dose? For example, aripiprazole, if you take it at bedtime, your 12-hour trough on average will be 11 times your dose. For haloperidol, it's 0.78 times your dose. Those numbers are there so people can order a test and have some general way of interpreting it. Yes, there's always variation if they're on inhibitors or inducers if they have variations in drug metabolism. But then as Dr. Stahl said, if you get a result back that looks weird, guess what? You know what you do, Andy? You get a second one. What's that? And then Uh, you'll know exactly what's going on. Are they poor metabolized or is it a drug interaction? But we still know what they're getting for that. The other elements which I provide are, as you say, the response threshold which just means if you're below that, you're unlikely to be a responder. It doesn't mean nobody responds, but the levels, uh, the rates are lower. And then the upper limit was what we call the state hospital, the point of futility. We have some of these folks at the state hospital, and they think, I can make everyone with schizophrenia better if I just give them enough haloperidol. <laughs> and 
guess what? There are people out there who will not develop significant Parkinsonism or akathisia, even on a strong D2 antagonist. But more is not going to solve their problem. I mean, we've recognized that there are forms of schizophrenia that are not D2 responsive. Am, am I right, Steve? Absolutely. And so, you know, some people maybe don't have a D2 related psychosis and you could block every receptor in the room, including a few, yours, a few of yours and mine, and it's still not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's where clozapine comes in, obviously. <clears throat> And maybe some of these newer drugs, too, which work on non-D2 binding mechanisms. But I think the point is that even if the person tolerates it, there's a line beyond which you're just wasting your time, that the chances of converting this non-responder to a responder are less than 5%. And we would call that an act of futility to just give them more when your odds of doing anything good for that person are less than 5%. Time to move along in the algorithm, which is typically going to be to close a beam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, how about this? How about, you know, we we're talking about why clinicians are not using plasma levels. What about ignorance? I can imagine a lot of people don't even realize you can get levels for some of these drugs. Well, that's it. And to be honest, for some of the newer molecules, levels are not readily available. But that's a reason, perhaps, to use agents where you can get levels and where the levels are interpretable, because it really does provide an additional level of information so you can guide their treatment. Um, But yes, for many molecules, I would say even lorazidone levels are now available, perhaps for the latest ones like cariprazine, lumetepirone, uh, brexpiprazole, maybe not so much. But if you're treating schizophrenia, you're often using other agents and levels are available and they are interpretable. Now, on these plasma level thresholds you're talking about, I'm assuming this is for schizophrenia, not for mood disorders. I would assume the plasma levels are less clear for mood disorders unstudied, really unstudied. I mean, you can make inferences based upon the dosing, but we don't necessarily look for plasma level correlations as much. Where the levels can be helpful, to be honest, would just be for tracking adherence in outpatients. So you had somebody who really yeah. needs maybe an atypical for anti-manic properties, occasionally for antidepressant properties too. It doesn't matter, but maybe they don't always take it. So every six months, you know, you would get their lithium level. And maybe if they're on adjunctive atypical for anti-manic properties like aripiprazole, if it's oral, you could get that level as well just to see if they're taking it. That's a really good point. And the fact is that for the antidepressant effect, it may not be the D2 blockade at all that's relevant. So, uh, it's, so what we're really saying here is that, you know, dose is not what drives the D2 receptor blockade. It's not what you have in the bottle, what you have in your hand, or what you have in your mouth. It's what you have in your blood that goes into the brain. And if you give standard doses and the patient does well, tolerates it, and responds, God bless you, you're done. No plasma drug level needed. But as soon as it doesn't work that way, then you have to resort to plasma drug levels. As I said, turn your headlights on because you've earned the right to get a plasma drug level. Things are not as they they appear. And we know that dose by your mouth, even if you are taken and non-adherence is not the issue, that dose cannot really predict as well as plasma drug levels what the outcome should be. And that's why you use it in that case. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. So we've already identified a couple of reasons why clinicians may not measure plasma levels. Let's say now we've converted some folks who want to do this. What are some of the challenges they're going to face? Finding a lab, cost, what are some of the challenges here, Jonathan? Most healthcare systems don't push back too much about cost. I hear people getting clozapine levels all the time, which is where it's most commonly used now uh, without too much issue. Very rarely do I hear that as a problem. I think the most frustrating aspect right now, and we'll talk about how that will change, but right now is that the turnaround is very slow. You get the level drawn, and then you don't get the result back for a week, maybe even a bit longer, which means in the short run, you have to make a decision without it. Eventually, the information will be available to you, and you'll be that much wiser about what's going on with your patient. But that is frustrating, but that will change. Technology improves. There is a company working on a finger stick point of care device, which will provide antipsychotic levels for six different analytes, and you'll have the result right there in your hot little hands within minutes. And that will really dramatically change the way we approach 
everything because now people will get the result right away and they'll really want to know how do I use this to make my patient better or how do I use this to manage their care and that'll be wonderful. You're not kidding. I think that'd be terrific. So can I just send this off to LabCorp or <laughs> some regular old lab would have antipsychotic plasma levels or do I need a specialty lab? No, what happens is the lab themselves, so let's say the local lab core doesn't run everything, but they may have a contract with a specialty lab. And that's what often the time factor is that I'm in a certain city, the lab core does a couple of things, but not everything. So they got to ship it off to somebody else. And that's where the delay comes in. You just have to find the right code on the analyte menu. And as I say, almost every commonly used antipsychotic approved in the last 30 years levels are available through lorazodone. After that, you're kind of on your own. Up through lorazodone, levels are available. You just have to find it. You just go to the LabCorp or the Quest or whoever's menu and just pick mm -hmm. the right code. Most importantly, again, make sure the antipsychotic is generally given predominantly or exclusively at bedtime and the lab must be a 12-hour trough. People come to me with labs and say, well, it was drawn at three in the afternoon. I don't think I can figure that one out. So really try to get it as a 12-hour trough. Okay, that's really helpful. Keeping up with the latest in psychiatry shouldn't be a struggle. SynovianFieldMedical.com is a new website for clinicians where you can find a library of free, hand-selected resources, such as videos and infographics, on important psychiatry topics. You can request an educational program for your practice or connect with Synovian medical professionals in your area. Synovian wants to help you get all of your psychiatry questions answered. Go to synovianfieldmedical.com and explore what Synovian has to offer. I'm wondering, uh, what is the two-week rule for acute response to oral antipsychotics? Well, this is something which has changed over time. So we've talked about how things have changed. You know, there was always a reason to measure, but now we have better guidance for people on how to measure antipsychotic levels and how to use them. When I trained as a psychiatrist in the last millennium, I was taught that a, quote, six-week trial of an antipsychotic at a therapeutic dose was sufficient to determine if they're going to be a responder or not to that drug without a lot of parameters on it. I mean, seemingly six weeks of any dose. Well, that was wrong then, and we figured that out in 2003, <laughs> that when you analyze acute schizophrenia trials, most of the response happens in the first two weeks. So how do we put this together with a drug level? So most of the response happens in the first two weeks. If you see somebody who has a less than minimal response after two weeks of a given dose, time is not going to solve their problem. It doesn't mean they're a failure because maybe they're like one of Dr. Cutler's patients who wasn't taking her antipsychotic. <laughs> the point being is you have to make a decision. Typically, we'll just say, well, let's go up on the dose, which is reasonable. But at some point, you may want to measure to figure out what is going on, especially if people aren't getting better and they're not experiencing adverse effects. But the idea is after each dosage increase, if you're going to see any signal of response within the first two weeks, that's fine. Then you can let the person go for another month. But if you see less than minimal response after week two, time is not your ally. Don't let the patient suffer for longer periods of time on a given dose, which is unlikely to be therapeutic. Yeah, you know, in this data you're talking about, this really converges with the information in the mood disorder field, too, where people are now realizing if you're not seeing at least 25% response in the first two weeks, you need to do something. And what that something mm -hmm. is could be, as you've said, raise the dose, augment or switch, but you have to use your judgment. And I think here again, the analogy of having the headlights on helps guide what you do. Yeah, you know, most people don't use rating scales, so they say, well, how can I, as a humble clinician, measure a 25% response? But guess what? If the patient has at least a minimal response, they say, I feel a bit better, that is one CGI severity point, and that, if you translated it to a rating scale like a PANS, would be more than 25% improvement. And so if the patient says, I feel a bit better, that's all I want to know. 
I want to do other things, but <laughs> that's sufficient for me. They say, right. yeah, my voices are a bit better. I'm happy with that. Let's let you roll another month. We see what we get. If they say, I, I don't feel anything, and I kind of clinically agree, then we will probably go up on the dose. But maybe at some point we're going to get a level just to see what's going on and why is this person not getting better. Well, of course, we're really talking about measurement-based care. And, you know, going back to the medical analogy, you would never treat hypertension without measuring blood pressure. You would never treat diabetes without measuring glucose. And yet, in our field, we go, we ballpark it. We go by the seat of our pants. What scales might be friendly for clinicians? Well, I would say, in particular, just your clinical impression is a lot of value. So I just alluded to this thing called the CGI severity scale. You're already using yeah. it, even if you think you are. Every time you see a patient, you say in your mind, hey, this guy's not sick at all. We're from at the state hospital. This is the sickest person with schizophrenia I've ever seen. Well, this is a seven-point Likert scale, which goes by degrees of severity. And the point being is that what we're looking for is meaningful response early, which is at least one CGI severity point. So they've moved at least one point on the scale downwards. And ideally, if we're lucky, we get about a 50% reduction in symptoms. If we're dealing with sicker people, we'll be happy with 30%. But this just gives you a rough ballpark estimate of overall reduction in psychosis symptoms, and it maps perfectly mathematically to the gold standard rating scales like the PANS or the BPRS. It's one thing I encourage people, especially as you're dealing with sicker patients, particularly inpatients, that you can use. We use it here at UC San Diego on the inpatient unit. Everyone gets a CGI severity when they come in, and they get one when they leave, and that way we document most people actually leave better than when they came in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the CGI is a very useful, clinically relevant scale. The PANS and the BPRS, of course, are not clinically viable. They just take too long and require specialized training. So, uh, you know, maybe people are doing more measurement-based care than they realize. Again, just write it. Write it down, document, call it the CGI severity, read about it. You know, it's in the plasma level handbook. I go through the anchors. Most people, if you got five people in a room talking about a particular patient, they would probably converge to one or two numbers. You know, it's like, oh, she's a two, she's a three. But the idea is at least you've documented a level of severity, and that can help you going forward. Plus, it helps other people working with that individual to get a sense of what you think their level of severity is. Yeah, I think it's also especially helpful to detect change. And that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. We want to document change and ideally improvement. So that's wonderful that you have that as a resource in the book as well. I would also recommend a terrific article by Steve Targum and Joan Bussner on the clinical interpretation of the CGI that really includes, they were the first to publish the anchor points for the CGI to really expand on them a little bit. And the CGI also is measuring not only symptoms, but function. It's sort of the overall clinical Gestalt taking mm -hmm. everything into account. So one level of improvement is not only symptomatic, but potentially functional improvement as well, which of course matters. Let's see, how do we change this thinking if we're using LAI tr tr treatments? How's the two-week scale modified for LAIs, or is it even modified? Yeah, it will be because the kinetics are very different. And so I give you an injection of a certain molecule. It may have a Cmax, which is not going to peak for a couple of weeks. And you have to know the kinetics. And, and I cover that in the book, which will be helpful to clinicians to show you for the various LAIs that were available at that time, what is the time to maximum level or the Tmax. So you have a sense of where I'm going to get my high levels. By convention, we typically try to draw levels just before the next injection when people are in a maintenance phase. For example, paliperidol and palmitate monthly, we give two injections on day one, on day eight, and then we start the maintenance a month later. I will typically get a level maybe after the second maintenance injection just to see where I'm at, and that can be very helpful. If you're using other preparations, you also time it uh, at the same interval. Part of the reason is maybe they weren't given a lot of trial on an oral and you want to kind of get a sense of where you're at, especially if somebody's experiencing adverse effects to guide you. There's a surprising amount of variability in drug metabolism. Even though you've taken the adherence piece out, Andy, you know, people mm -hmm. metabolize drugs very differently. Even a drug like paliperidone, it's not metabolized. It's mostly excreted unchanged. 
there can be a tenfold range in difference in drug levels in people wow. just a month after their two loading doses. It's a tenfold range. And that's How's why that measuring can... Well, there's differences in adiposity. There's differences uh-huh. in cardiac output. And because paliperidone, which is 9-hydroxyrisperidone, has high affinity for the P-glycoprotein transporter, there's differences in its expression as well as polymorphisms, which are functional differences. All of those translate to some people clear the drug really quickly and some people not so fast. Yeah, the PGP proteins are fascinating. That's a whole other source of blood level variability. We always focus on the cytochrome P450 system in liver enzymes, but there's many variables Mm -hmm. involved. So thank you for pointing that out. That was extremely helpful. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, LAIs are really interesting because, as you said, you've taken the adherence out of the equation, assuming that the patient shows up on time for their injection visits. You really know they're getting it. And so then you really can look at the pharmacokinetics without that variable. Yeah. The only other reason to get it maybe a couple of times in the first year is it takes a bit of time to get to steady state. Even if you load it, you get what's called level creep over time. And you don't want to overshoot, especially if you're using a highly potent first generation antipsychotic, let's say haloperidol decanoa. You don't want to overshoot and give somebody a tolerability problem. Once people are past really month nine, the levels are never going to change unless there's been some dramatic change in their exposure to inhibitors or inducers. But having a few levels in the first, let's say, year can just give you an eyeball of have the levels finally plateaued and then everything is cool or they're still going up, particularly if new adverse effects appear. It gives you a frame of reference for deciding how to adjust future doses. Steve, what do you think about clinicians in, out in the field, just general clinicians using plasma levels? Is this something they should be doing routinely in certain situations? What advice should we give them? They can, too, earn the right to get a plasma drug level. That's by having a patient who doesn't respond to standard dosing. And the interesting thing is there's certainly a lot of routine patients who do. And so we're not talking about them. But the ones who don't come back more frequently. So if you're practicing in mental health, you're probably going to see in your day the failures more than the victories. Victories come back, you know, with greater intervals between their training or between their their, their follow-ups. So I think in the field, you know, it can be a pain in the butt to find out where to send these things. Okay. Yeah. And so that that's a barrier. And they're not very expensive. But, uh, you know, figure out where the blood's going to get drawn, how's it going to get shipped, how you can get the results back. Yes. So you have to establish a routine. But if you're taking care of patients who don't respond to standard doses, then that's what you have to do. And the, I've just read today, 65% of non-urban counties in America don't have any psychiatrist. Wow. More than half of counties in America, including urban ones, don't have a child psychiatrist. So wow. uh, if you're practicing... You're going to see the cases, and you're going to need to know how to use plasma drug levels. Or if you really don't want to do it, then figure out a referral pattern to someone in an urban area who can handle it. Well, you're bringing up an important point, Steve. Psychiatrists were a little bit of an endangered species, it seems like. We're not replacing ourselves very well. And it seems like the 60 60 rule. Remember, I told you the 60 (laughs) 60 rule? 60% of psychiatrists are over 60. And we're falling off oh, the gosh. perch faster than we can manufacture new ones. Oh, unfortunately, Jonathan and I have recently crossed that threshold. So I I'm feel way over that threshold. Just a little bit. But, you know, what it really points out is the importance of, of non-physician providers, nurse practitioners, PAs. They're a very rapidly growing group, and they are helping to fill the void in some of these rural areas. As I go around the country speaking, I certainly see that. So is this something that they could incorporate into their practices too? Well, according to me, I'd say not only why not, but why the heck not? You know, I don't think it's difficult to learn. You can pick it up from a book. You can pick it up from certain courses. I've taught this at the Harvard CME course for the past couple of years. So we teach it at the NEI courses all the time every year. We've got it online. And so there's access to this. And, um, you know, that's the standard of care right now. If you don't have patients that respond, you've got to measure plasma antipsychotic levels. 
Yeah, it kind of seems like a no-brainer to me. But I would say, yes, clearly, you don't have to be a physician. I think sometimes people think you have to be a physician to order blood work or to interpret blood work. That's certainly not true. Any prescriber should be able to do this. And I highly rec- I have to highly recommend the book, gentlemen, that you've published, this, the Antipsychotic Plasma Level Guide, as a really a one-stop resource for all of these things that we're talking about. And you know what? If, if you can't get anything else, just get one of us to send you the secret. I told you there was a secret in here. And the, the, it, there's a nice table of plasma thresholds, how it combines, compares to other you know, things that give published levels and the point of futility that John, Jonathan talked about. And so if you get that table, you can have the critical antipsychotics, know how to do it, and get the levels from the lab and you're off and running. And yes, non-physicians are going to be the backbone of mental health delivery in the next decades and centuries, because that's who's going to be there for that practice. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. Jonathan, we've talked about a number of nuts and bolts here. I want to shift gears and talk about some special situations. And let's talk about certain situations like someone who has hepatic impairment, or has had bariatric surgery, or renal dysfunction, or even on hemodialysis, how do we use plasma levels in some of these situations? Well, bariatric surgery really is the no-brainer one. Uh, We sometimes have no idea or no ability to predict how individual molecules absorption will change depending on the type of surgery that somebody has. And You just measure the level beforehand, you measure it afterwards, and you make the dosage adjustments. I I don't think there's anything more to say about that. You do the same thing if you're on lithium or divalproil. So, like, I'm going to have my stomach stapled. I'm going to have a ruined wall. Whatever they do to your plumbing doesn't matter to me. I know your (laughs) valproate level was 85, and that's going to be our benchmark going forward. Same thing with antipsychotics. But I think to the point that both of you made, it picks a premium really on trying to get people to respond to drugs where levels are more easily available. There probably is one lab in North America where I can get a cariprazine level. I don't know where it is. I think it's probably within the confines of the AbbVie Corporation. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, yes, and there's a reason to use it. And obviously, cariprazine has some interesting properties. But for a lot of the folks we treat, it's good to be able to have labs which are interpretable. And if you can't get a level on lumetaparone, well, there's reason to use it. But if people aren't getting better, to Dr. Stahl's point, it does kind of push you maybe to try to get agents on board for this patient's care where the levels are available and are interpretable. So hepatic dysfunction is something that's in the package insert of every antipsychotic pretty much because they all go through the liver one way or the other. The only point there is when we say hepatic dysfunction, we meet people with advanced cirrhosis not somebody with elevated transaminases. Advanced cirrhosis is detected using the child pew criteria. Some of you have heard me talk about that at NEI and elsewhere, which means you have a high bilirubin, you have a low albumin, or an elevated INR. And you just go to a table. I would say, Andy, the place I go to for my source of information on child pew and the scoring table is Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a table there. You look it up, you add up the points. 99% of the time, your patients are going to be child PUA, and it'll be a non-issue. You use whatever dose you want. But these are situations where having drug levels can be really helpful. Maybe you do have the one guy in your town who does have advanced cirrhosis with schizophrenia, and you're going to start him on a new medication, and you want to do the appropriate dosage adjustments and see what you get. Package inserts will often give you guidance for newer drugs, but for older drugs, there is no guidance. I can tell you, there is no word child pew in the haloperidol package insert. And (laughs) this way you have levels that can help you manage this individual's care. Same thing when you have people with severely impaired renal function. Interestingly, dialysis doesn't affect drug levels as much as we thought previously, because a lot of these drugs are bound to alpha-1 glycoproteins. But this will help you prove the point that things haven't changed so much. If you had somebody on a stable dose of an antipsychotic who now needs to be dialyzed, at least it'll reassure everyone involved that everything looks good with this. When should you get your blood level with respect to dialysis? In other words, should you get it before or after they've been dialyzed? 
Yeah, most people would say a reasonable trough is right before. And the same would be true if you have, there's probably 18 people in the world who still take lithium who are on dialysis. It just kind of gives you a sense of what the high trough is, so to speak, because you know a lot of this stuff will be lowered somewhat by dialysis. Although again, antipsychotics, not as much, and people have done that. And if you're really curious, you know, you could get one the day before dialysis or just before, you know, they'll draw it from the shunt. And if you're really curious, you could get a level the next day. Maybe you don't get it back for a yeah. week, but you could kind of see, hey, guess what? Dialysis didn't change things too much. And that'll be reassuring for all involved. That is a really good point. Now, you did mention earlier, there is one antipsychotic that has minimal, if any, liver metabolism, and that's paliperidone, which mm-hmm. is already the active metabolite of risperidone. So I guess that's one to consider if a patient does have significant liver failure or cirrhosis. Would you agree? I will disagree with you, Dr. Cutler. Every oh, antipsychotic can be considered. All you have to do is just make the dosage adjustments. That's it. And measure uh-huh. the level. Yeah. I mean, and then to be honest, very few people out there, I'm going to say right now, if somebody has a patient with child PUB, I want you to email me via NEI and I'll respond. But most people will never see these individuals with advanced cirrhosis. Child PUC patients are so sick. They're in an ICU trying to get a liver. But I had one child PUB (laughs) patient with schizophrenia at the VA, one, and I was there for 15 years, just one. But It doesn't matter what their liver function is. You just make the appropriate mathematical adjustment. And levels are your friend there so you can see what's going on. So people will mostly be able to clear a drug. Even if they had child PUC, you just have to make the appropriate dosage adjustment. And that's where the level can help you with that. Yeah, and I think I, I want to emphasize the point you made that you know even though we call transaminases LFTs, they are not actually liver function tests. They're merely measures of irritation, if you will, inflammation, irritability mm-hmm. of the liver, just exactly. irritation more than anything else. The really things you want to look at for synthetic function, as you mentioned, include things like albumin and uh, the coagulop the coags, PT and PTT. I, INR specifically. Yeah, you just look at INR, INR which yeah. is the yeah. to drive from the PT, the albumin, which will be low That's if you have advanced cirrhosis, and the third lab and the child pew scale is Billy Rubin, the Billy and there's two Rubin. clinical criteria, ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. Again, how many of you out there have somebody yep. with ascites and hepatic encephalopathy? <laughs> exactly. Virtually not. Yeah. But the point being yeah. is Dr. Cutler said it has nothing to do with transaminases, and please don't make that mistake. And it says it in the package insert, child pew, and it'll give you the point breakdown for A, B, and C. Yeah. Yeah, the BUN may also be useful looking at urea, but that is for more advanced, of course, more advanced cases. Okay, well, boy, that's really helpful. So it sounds like this book has a wealth of information on various scenarios and various situations where obtaining plasma levels can be useful. We didn't talk about one other thing I want to ask you about quickly. Let's say somebody has a high plasma and a psychotic level. Obviously, it depends on what the patient is doing clinically, but is there any situ- is there any guidance you can give to people about dealing with a plasma level that's higher than expected or higher than maybe you're comfortable with? It depends absolutely on how the patient's doing clinically. So there's two points here. For one thing, we, we've talked a lot about issues with the laboratory. One thing I figured out when I got into this world of antipsychotic plasma levels is that This is the one area of medicine where the reference ranges from the labs are useless completely and like wrong, wrong. (laughs) So what's an example of what I mean by that? Lab A, I won't say which one, I published this, says the point of futility or the upper limit for the therapeutic range of flufenazine was 2.0. Fair enough. Lab B says it's 10.0. Let me ask you, Dr. Oh Stahl, how many labs out there which say the upper limit of dive out prolix is 120, but the next guy says it's 600? Do we see that very often? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah. And the problem is it's confusing so to clinicians. And, yeah. and that's really the issue. It's confusing to clinicians. And that's why I published this book and other groups have published upper limit levels, which are evidence-based. So don't react to what's on the lab first. The first Look at the patient. Get a level. Do- Yes. That's hey, right. how about that? Treat, treat, <laughs> and, treat a patient, not a lab. That was something I was trained. Well, so the first first thing is if the person's an outpatient, we all know how to do telepsychiatry. If the patient can't negotiate that or they're not in front of a computer or a smartphone, you call them up and say, hey, Mr. Gutierrez, I got your clozapine level back and it's 1300. How are you doing? He says, well, I'm 
sitting here watching television and, you know, I want to watch the U.S. <laughs> men's national soccer team lose again to a country that's one, with one-tenth our population. <laughs> but the most important thing is document that you've assessed the patient. So that's number one. So I called the patient or I saw the patient and they look the same. There's no new adverse effects and whatever adverse effects they had are, are about the same. So that's important. Now, of course, if they do have adverse effects and you say, okay, maybe we've overshot, we have to reduce the dose. But I think the point right. is that some of these people are the victim of a laboratory error because maybe the level was drawn at the wrong time. So perhaps they did take a morning dose and then the level was drawn right after. Now, Jonathan, you have a rule of thumb for when how much variation you'll allow to, to think it's a lab error and how much is normal lab variation. What are you going to tell them? I usually say you got to allow a certain amount of noise, about plus or minus 30% from their mean. That's probably consistent with average adherence. If you start to see jumps of 50% or more, there's something else going on. It's usually, Steve, not adherence, but it could be laboratory error too. And that's something you have to think about when it really makes no sense. Repeat and, the test. I think that's, so there's two profound things that Jonathan said here. Look at the patient. If you have a question, repeat the test. That's not very difficult. <laughs> yeah, no, and also not. look to see if it makes sense. Let me give you two scenarios. Patient A, the clozapine level comes back at 1,250. This is a state hospital patient. We go look at him. He's fine. He's walking around. And then we look at his prior levels. Well, they're all 1,000 to 1,200. So this is where he lives. <laughs> right. It's within the range. As Dr. Stahl said, there's a certain amount of noise. We're going to bounce up and down, maybe as much as 30%. We don't worry about it. We assess the patient. We say the level is high, but he's tolerating it. He's tolerating it for a long time. We document our rationale for not changing the dose. Here's scenario two. This was a patient who was on, let's say, 600 QHS of clozapine, and the level was 700, still a non-responder. Clinician bumps it up by 50 milligrams, gets a level. The level comes back, also 1250. Well, that makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> First, we assess right. the patient. He says, I'm fine. I feel the same as I did before they increased my dose from 600. Staff verifies that. This is laboratory error, and we document that. Number two. You document, number one, you assess the patient. Number two, you document your rationale for what you're going to do. If you think it's lab error, as Dr. Stahl said, well, you just check it again the next day and you document why you think it's lab error. This makes no sense. We went up 10% on the dose. This dose went up 50%. This makes no sense. Or this patient's levels have always been high and he tolerates it. I'm not going to change it. But those are your two keys. Assess the patient and then document. And then number three is try to find an evidence-based source for what's kind of an upper limit. Again, you're always doing it based upon the patient, but sometimes you'll inherit people who they really did overshoot. It's like, okay, I had a patient. I inherited at the VA. No one ever done a close up level on him. It was 1,500. And I rechecked it, Steve. It was still 1,500. And, he, and I didn't believe it because he looked fine. No sialuria, no constipation. Oh, this can't be. It be. It was. And then eventually <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> let's see if we can shave you down a little bit. And he actually did best, you know, when his level was above 1,000. He did like 1,200 for optimum response. Uh, but at least I documented what was going on. And then I documented why I was going to go back. But I went back slowly. So you're bringing up an I important think, problem because you've seen it more than once where someone would be covering and they'd see a level like that, panic and hold the drug because they don't have the context and they don't understand plasma levels and they haven't read the book. No. Yeah, that's it. And these are disasters we see happening, unfortunately, all the time where the lab, quote, upper limit is six or 700. This is somebody who always lives at 1,000 or 1,100, but the person on call, you know, not paying attention, like, oh, the level's 1,100. You know, it comes back after hours, and they cut the person's dose in half, and then the person obviously relapses. And that's why I do not make reflexive changes just based upon what the lab says. Again, the lab upper limit for antipsychotics is not evidence-based. And number one, assess the patient. Then number two, figure out what's going on and document your rationale for what you're going to do. And let me get this right now. Jo Jonathan said three things here. First of all, look at the patient. Second of all, consider repeating the test. And third of all, think. How about that? Not too hard. <laughs>
Well, that's true. You know, common sense isn't common sometimes, I would say. Jonathan, the these reference ranges we're talking about, the upper value of the reference range from the lab, what does that mean? Is that the upper limit of therapeutic value? Is that where toxicity happens? Is that the point of futility? What is that? From the lab, I can tell you, because when I was writing a review paper about this, I called these labs. I called Quest. I called Mayo. I called LabCorp. I said, how did you come up with this upper limit for this antipsychotic? And you know what the response I got was? We don't know. <laughs> so I'm nobody sure. knows what it is. I mean, literally, they told me that. You know, Somebody probably looked it up wow. years ago. They don't know what their method was. And yeah. that's why I say this is the least reliable area of medicine. Again, we see a five-fold difference in range for an upper limit for two different labs for flufenazine, a two-fold difference for haloperidol. Wow. Some labs don't even give you an upper limit for clozapine. You realize this yeah. is not the source of information. Now, people are used to worshiping the lab and saying, this is what I must practice mm -hmm. by. The lab says it's high. This is the one area where right. I say this is not the source of information to be trusted. And number one, well, I think we're so, look at the patient. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's because we're so used to lithium levels and uh, valproate levels where those levels really do mean something. Those upper levels really do start to approximate toxicity. Yeah, those are medicines which generally have much narrower therapeutic indices, number one. And number two, it takes time for clinicians to unlearn that I should trust the lab for everything. Generally, they should. I mean, I'm not even going to tell you to put, push someone's sodium to 150 because it's a good idea. That ain't right. <laughs> but this is the one area where it's wrong. And people say, well, but the, close, the lab says 600. My patient's closed me as 800. Am I going to get sued? And my point is, no, we have other evidence-based sources for this. This is not an evidence-based source, number one. And number two, you're going to document. You're going to, as Dr. Stahl said, think, and then you're going to document what is going on. And now you have a reference book which can talk about why sometimes we will push clozapine levels above 600, as high as 1,000, if tolerated in search of yes. efficacy. And other groups have published similar types of tables. And I summarize a lot of that, as Dr. said, in sort of the hidden secrets of the book, which you can find. <laughs> Great. What about the lower limit of these reference ranges? Does that correlate at all with like a minimum threshold for response? Or is that also kind of unreliable? Well, I don't really get their information. I think that's generally their intent is that this is, but I can tell you for some drugs, they clearly are kinetic reference ranges and not therapeutic. And that's why I say mm -hmm. this is one area where what you get from the lab, just ignore it really. It's not going to be your friend. It's not going to help you find another source of information for deciding what is the response threshold and what is what we call the point of futility, that upper limit, which going beyond is probably just a waste of time. Yeah, I think, well, those alone, as Steve said, those tables in your book are so important, so useful. And then that formula that you talked about, the conversion for what plasma level should I expect for what dose of the medication, I think those are incredibly useful benchmarks. There's nothing else really worth getting, getting a hold of the copy of this book. Well, gentlemen, it looks like we're coming to the end of our time here. I really th hope that this was useful for our audience. I think it was extremely useful, very pragmatic. And just like we talked about in the Clozapine podcast, I hope we've convinced people to dip their toe in the water here and to add this tool to their armamentarium, really maximize the benefit of what we do for our patients. Jonathan, do you have any final words for our audience? Well, again... If you have someone in valproate, you don't guess, you measure. The same thing with antipsychotics for all the same reasons. Yes, if you have somebody on a stable LAI, maybe they're not so worried about adherence and I don't need to get a level once they've been on it for a year. But when you have people on oral medication, we need to track adherence chronically. When people aren't getting better, whether it's oral or LAI, you need to figure out what's going on. Are they kinetic failure? If they're on orals, are they adherence failure? Otherwise, as Dr. Stahl said, you're driving with your headlights off, and that's just not a good way to practice medicine. Oh, I certainly agree. Steve, final thoughts? Yeah, I think it's not that hard. It's a matter of, like you say, think and look at the patient. And I'll give the audience a closing dare. I dare you to take plasma drug levels in patients on antipsychotics that are not doing well and to look up 
the point of futility and to push towards that and do that three times and tell me it doesn't work in any of those cases and I'll eat my hat. The proof <laughs> is in the pudding. This is not theoretical. I'm daring you because I think you'll be happy and you'll find it works. And this is why this approach has, has really become quite popular. And in, in fact, you know, I'll give you an anecdote. I say I, I teach at various places. One of these places at the Harvard, when I was talking, one of the famous psychiatrists in the audience says, you know, I listen to these CME talks year after year. He says, but you know what? I finally learned something. <laughs> and that's about plasma drug levels. And since then, I can tell you that the Harvard-related r- hospitals have instituted plasma drug levels and much more monitoring. So, you know, it's growing like wildfire. I dare you to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, Steve, I can verify that. I, I, I've i had several examples of that where I h- held my nose. I got blood level. It was low in a patient that I thought was adherent. I held my nose, pushed the dose super therapeutic to a point where I was a little bit skittish. And Lo and behold, the patient did better. So it's really about treating the patient and not the dose and not the lab value. It's really being a good clinician and using your judgment, trusting your eyes and your brain. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been extremely helpful. And I want to thank you, the audience, for listening. I hope you got something out of this. I want to highly recommend this antipsychotic plasma level book, the handbook that Jonathan and Stephen Stahl have published. And I want to remind you to please listen to the other episodes in our Psychopharmacology podcast series and listen to the other NEI podcasts. We have various others. Some are CME, some are not. And for more information on our other educational offerings, please go to our website, www.neiglobal.com. That's neiglobal.com. Thanks so much. This is Andy Cutler signing off. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 